Kelly, welcome. <laughs> All right, you're on mute. The statement of 2020. Uh, and yes, now I'm, now I'm here. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for letting me know that. I might have given a better talk if nobody could hear me. <laughs> it's good to see you, Kelly. Thank you for joining us from, uh, from Duke, from South Carolina. North and, Carolina. I mean, North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do on the West Coast. Everything's a blur. <laughs> um, on, the, on the other side, I'm just kidding. So Kelly Brownell is known to many of you, and uh, he is a former uh, eight, president of SBM and, and many societies. He's a member of AVMR. He is, um, has had a remarkable trajectory of his own interests and career and impact. Um, he was my graduate advisor uh, at Yale. And at that point, he had come from studying obesity with um, looking at, you know, with um, Stunkard and looking at individual treatment. Then he moved to couples treatment because he saw how important the dietic influences and the family influences were. Then he moved to family treatment. Um, and by the time I got to um, work with Kelly, um, he was working on the toxic food environment. And he had a uh, famous op-ed in the New York Times about a snack tax. And he still gets letters about that today. That was how high impact, that was how much it struck a chord, um, an angry chord that, that someone would try to regulate the food industry. <laughs> and so he then worked on food policy and then realized that his, the biggest impact he could have is teaching students who would go into public policy. And he is now the Dean of the School of Public Policy at Duke. And he's done some remarkable work um, interdisciplinary work with his food, World Food Policy Center. And so uh, we've asked him to just come share with us how he thinks about how research can be more strategic from the outset, right when we ask the questions, and how it can have a bigger impact on population health. So thank you, Kelly. Welcome. Thanks, Alyssa. Uh, that's really a lovely introduction. I appreciate it. Just a couple of observations before I begin the talk. One is that uh, you said I was currently dean of the School of Public Policy. I was formerly dean of the School of Public Policy. I remember a good friend uh, and colleague, Ken Warner, who was uh, the dean of the School of Public Policy, University of Michigan. After he stepped down, he told me his, favorite, his most favorite title was ex-dean of all his professional career. And I can see why. It's actually kind of a glorious thing being ex-dean. Um, uh, and Alyssa, I also want to thank you for inviting me and tell you how uh, impressed I am that you've been able to pull off this meeting. I mean, you basically arranged this three times, I think. And uh, <laughs> boy, it, it's, it's not an easy thing to do at all. Thank you. It's been a team effort. But I do want to say everyone here, it's their first meeting in, you know, probably almost two years. It has been so worth it. It's been the conversations have just been buzzing with, mm. you know, connection, ideas, collaboration. It's just so different in person. It's incredible. I bet. Well, another thing I wanted to say is that if I look back on my career, there are a lot of things um, that I can take pleasure in. But I think the, the thing I take most pleasure in are the, the wonderful work that students who worked with me have done. And you're right, right up on that list. Um, and so I'm really happy uh, to, to see your career thrive, Alyssa. And this um, conference is sort of a culmination of that. So congratulations. It's really wonderful to see this. Um, and I have to say, I've been personally affected by this conference. I've now changed the way I, I'm breathing based on this last talk. And I don't think I've ever gone into a talk so relaxed. So I'm grateful that talk preceded <laughs> me. So, okay, let's get, let's get going. Um, so I'd like to talk about how I faced a frustrating issue in my own career and, and how we came to grips with that. And basically, the frustration came about from feeling that um, our work wasn't having the kind of impact we thought it should, and that we had created this sort of internal definition of impact within our profession that didn't make a lot of sense to me. And so we moved to a, a little bit different model of research that I think might be a companion to the traditional programmatic research that the field does. So let me explain what all that means and how I got to where we are now. Um, so... Alyssa, do I control the slides or do I, what do I do here? Um, theoretically, you can control your own slides. So why don't you try it and see if it works? 
Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. So my question is, was uh, back when we started thinking about this, how good are we really at creating change from our research? And I think, uh, you know, what we're really in the business to do is to try to create impact from knowledge that gets created during the scientific enterprise. And so we produce knowledge and, and we hope it'll be done in the service of society. Um, and we hope at the end of the day that society actually gets served by this knowledge. But the question is, what, what lies in the middle there? What's necessary in order for the knowledge to actually benefit society in some way? And as we begin to think about this, the frustration that I was encountering is that uh, research seems to, in, in, in most cases, reach pretty small audiences. In some cases, discouragingly small number of people uh, read the work we do. Um, research tends to miss key audiences. Those are the people in a position to do something about a problem that we care about. And that this, this uh, creates four links between scholarship and public policy and, and social change overall. So one of the problems that, um, that I thought about is how do we construe the concept of impact? And um, the, the field has gotten increasingly sophisticated at coming up with indices and metrics for impact. But I don't think is ever, well, I don't want to say ever, but I don't think too often stops to think about what the impact is designed to do in the first place. <clears throat> and so if we come up with sophisticated measures of something that's kind of a weak concept to begin with, it doesn't mean that the concept is any less weak. So in thinking about this, if we think about what, what we're kind of put on earth to do as scientists, one, one is to impress other scientists to be sure, and impress is not the right word, but to influence their work in a positive way. But that doesn't necessarily mean the work, the work is having any outside impact beyond what we're doing within the field. And so this idea that impact should be defined by how much other scientists like and cite our work, um, I think would be um, construed by the outside world as a pretty bizarre um, definition of impact. And it doesn't really capture at all whether the, the work is making a difference in any way. So that's what we started thinking about um, in, our, in our own work. And one way to think about this is kind of a relay race, that if your team is running a relay race and you drop the baton, you're disqualified and there's no way you can win the race. And it seems to me that in the world of science, when you think about social and policy impact, that we do the work and we hope that some baton gets passed to some mysterious people or institutions out there who can take the work and make a difference with it. Um, but we drop the baton typically rather than successfully pass it because we're not trained to pass the baton. We don't really know who to pass the baton to. Um, and our work may be done in such a way that the baton doesn't contain the necessary information to appeal to the person who might be taking it. And so the question is, can we pass the baton more effectively and have information that might be more relevant to the people in the position to create impact from it? So some of the things that we do as a scientific world, uh, we get, in, get on our own way. Um, for, for example, science can be really slow. Now, some of this is preventable, but if you think about how long it might take to get a grant, get human subjects research if you're doing that kind of work, uh, get the work done, uh, write it up, publish it. You're talking about a long, long time. And this is occurring in a, in a world where everything else is moving very, fa very fast. And so there's a little bit of being out of sync here. Um, if we communicate it only with people within the field, that's poorly communicating because other people who could make use of the information may not even see it. Um, we can be unresponsive to real world questions uh, because we're sort of telling each other what the important questions are. Um, it can be only programmatic rather than strategic, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, there can be conflicts of interest. So not all, all of us are working in the area I am, which is food policy, where there are huge conflicts of interest problem. But a lot of other people work in areas where this is true, where there are parties that stand to make money. Uh, there's an industry affected, and so the science can be conflicted. And then, then we kind of get in our own way sometimes by creating this jargon that's hard for the rest of the world to decipher. So just take two examples in psychology and psychiatry. 
somewhere along the, word, the way we came up with the word symptomatology to where the word symptoms probably would have done just fine. We have methodology rather than just talking about methods. And these are just two little examples of things we do that make it harder for us to make our, our information relevant to and communicable to uh, people outside. So we began thinking, um, this goes back now about 20 years, linking scholarship to public policy. And I'd like to describe how we went about trying to affect this um, in hopes that maybe some of this information would be helpful. So if we think about research, we ultimately might hope, or some of us, depending on the kind of work we do, that it will affect other scientists, that will, it might ultimately create social or policy change in ways that lots of people could, could benefit. Um, I think we're pretty good at communicating with other scientists, but not so good in these other areas. And the question is, can we do anything about that? And so we began to think about what would lie in between the research and the social and policy change. And it begins, at least from the way we think about this, with identifying change agents. And change agents can be defined as the people or institutions who, as I said before, are in a position to do something about the problem we care about. And these people or institutions vary a lot depending on the problem we care about. You know, they could be a school board, they could be the press, they could be lots of, you know, uh, not just the elected leaders we sort of automatically think about, but it could be a lot of other parties. So in our area of food policy, I'll give you some examples of change agents. Uh, but if, again, these will differ depending on the topic and, and who would be in a position to do something. So legislators obviously come to mind. In our case, people that work in, in regulatory agencies and institutions become really important players as well. People like the work in the USDA, the FDA, the FTC, and other organizations like that are very important players. Uh, the courts can be really important. Think about uh, how the judiciary... Um, and lawsuits figured into the tobacco uh, wars and have, have come into play in a lot of other areas too. Automobile safety would be an example. Um, the press can be very important if public opinion needs to change in order to drive the social and policy change. Uh, that gets to the public opinion. Um, we also can think about NGOs being important parties in some with some problems in some parts of the world, the NGOs can be really very important players. And then, of course, industry might be involved, too, and in influencing industry in some way, whether with a carrot or a stick, could be potentially pretty helpful. So this model really begins with trying to think out, think who can do something about a problem, and then think about how we can interact with them in a constructive way. So we're wondering, can we create a virtuous cycle of solutions here? And this is the model of strategic science that I'd, I'd like to present. So it begins, as I said, with identifying the change agents, then creating strategic questions that can be addressed in research based on information that comes from the change agents. What information is important in their world? And then we can do the research. And then a very important part of this is communicating the research back to the change agents. And that's sometimes where the baton gets dropped. So in this, this model of strategic research, the idea is that the change agents can benefit greatly from research if we're asking the right questions and doing the, the right kind of studies that are important in their world. Um, and if we develop questions that lead to research, the results of which are important in that policy or social change context. And then, of course, having that positive feedback loop with the change agents becomes very important. And this is really much different than, than the way we typically do it. So if we, we typically think of, okay, we do our science, we hope the change agents see it. Now, sometimes we're a little more active than just this sort of passive, let's hope for the best approach. But that might mean let's do a policy brief or let's do press releases or I'll talk to the press when they call and things like that. But this ignores the fact that sometimes the most important exchange of information is from the change agents to us, not just the reverse. And in some cases, that becomes even more important than the reverse. And so this bridge that you can create with the information flow going back and forth 
um, can be extremely helpful. And I've learned so much from the the people who we're talking about as change agents um, in ways that have really informed our research. And I'll give you some examples of that. So this is uh, something that we've written about. I've written two separate papers. This is with Christina Roberto, um, our uh, colleague at the University of Pennsylvania, as many of you know. Um, this paper was published in Lancet, but there's an additional paper beyond this, and it describes this model of strategic research. <clears throat> and I said before, <laughs> and I'd like to reiterate, this is not meant to replace programmatic research, but potentially to be a companion to it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'd like to give four case examples of this, studies that we've done in these particular areas that capture this strategic science model. So case number one has to do with industry and menu labeling. Uh, you may remember that New York City was the first jurisdiction to begin thinking about requiring restaurants to put calorie values on menus and on menu boards in the case of drive-in restaurants. Um, the restaurant industry really didn't like this idea. They fought it uh, and sued New York City twice, but New York City finally uh, passed the regulation through its health department. Uh, it, it went into effect um, and they prevailed in the courts on this. So in, in with a public health victory like this, it's great that somebody has the courage and the insight to go first, but what you hope is that then a lot of other people come close behind uh, being second, third, and fourth in line, so you get more than just this one victory, albeit in a big place. Um, and one of the states that was quickly out, the, there were cities that came out of the gate pretty quickly after New York, Miami, Philadelphia, uh, were examples of this. But the state of California also got interested in doing this at the state level. Um, at the time, the, um, the governor, Schwarzenegger, said that the only way he would sign legislation was if the restaurant industry and the public health community could decide on the terms of the legislation. So it became a compromise process from the very beginning. And one of the concessions that the uh, restaurant industry wanted granted from the very beginning was to exempt drive-in windows, uh, drive-in restaurants from having to put the information on menu boards. And the, um, their, their rationale for this is that there's only so much room on these menu boards and they couldn't be adding a bunch of calorie values as if they couldn't afford to get a bit bigger board and add the, the information. But they really didn't want people seeing the information from my perspective and therefore wanted this concession granted. Now, it seemed to me when I heard this that there are a lot of people that go through these drive-in windows. I didn't know how many, but you know we've all seen things like this where you get very long lines of cars going through these drive-in windows. So one, one morning, I got a call from another person some of you may know, Harold Goldstein, who's a, a well-known advocacy leader in California. And he was telling me about this, this particular legislation. Um, and uh, talked about the concession that the industry wanted. So I was thinking after our call, there are a lot of people that go through these windows. Um, and so what I did that day was canceled some new meetings I had. I got a clipboard and I went in my, I was at Yale University at the time, um, got my clipboard, sat across the street from a McDonald's in Guilford, Connecticut. Uh, and I just counted the number of people who drove in versus walked in. You know, it wasn't good science. It was just me and my clipboard, and I might have mistaken a dog in the front seat for a person or whatever. Um, but at the end of a couple hours of observation, it turned out that about 60% of people were driving in as opposed to walking into the restaurant. So then um, the, um, I went back and spoke to, with our graduate students about this, and several of them got on this and did a proper study. Um, this was the study I mentioned Christina Roberto um, before, but she and others then went to work and did a proper study. So they did thousands of observations, reliability checks, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, different areas, different types of restaurants, et cetera. And they found after this that it was pretty close to 60% of people were, were driving in. But we had data, solid data to, um, uh, to support this observation. So we then fed that information back to the advocacy community in California, 
and also to people elsewhere in the country, including people at the national level who are considering this kind of legislation and saying, you know, we got to watch out for this because you're going to miss 60% of the population if you grant this concession. And so in place after place after place, the, um, this concession was not granted because of this pretty quick study we did. Now, this, this is not high science. It, it wasn't based on anything theoretical. It just came right from the, the potential change agent, in this case, an NGO. Um, and, um, the, but, but it had pretty big impact in, in the policy community. It was a bit of strategic science um, that, that turned out to be pretty helpful at the time. Um, so that's, that's one example. And if we think about the mechanism that I talked about before, the impact of this might, was, was seemed to be occurring through the NGOs who in turn were using the information to affect the legislative process. And this ultimately was part of the picture in the social and policy change that came about from those sort of public health actions. Uh, case number two, and this is on a little bit different topic, has to do with children's food marketing. Uh, when I was at Yale, uh, my colleagues and I uh, were funded for a number of years, and, and they're still doing this work at the Rudd Center, uh, to examine the impact of food marketing directed at children. And the, the work we looked, uh, created, we created a number of reports from this, and this effort was led by Jennifer Harris, uh, who um, just does terrific work. And this is pretty compl complex work, but um, she, she produced report after report with other colleagues at the Rudd Center showing how much marketing children were exposed to, what products were being marketed, whether there was targeted marketing to vulnerable populations beyond children um, and, and the like. And these are all available online at the Rudd Center website. So, the first project uh, caught our interest because it had to do with marketing of breakfast cereals to children. And what, uh, what we did, again, led by Jennifer Harris, was to use a nutrition index that had been uh, created by scientists at Ox University of Oxford in uh, England, where uh, you, cre you can create a nutrition score for any food product. And the score takes into account a number of um, the, the nutrients that a food is comprised of and then gives you an overall score. So the score would you have higher, better score if you, um, if a food has more fiber, you'd have less if it has a lot of saturated fat and salt and sugar and things. And so then we could take each of the breakfast cereals um, and give it a score based on this nutrition index. And so if you take the best dozen cereals, that is the ones with the most favorable nutrition scores, and here's what they happen to be, and a lot of which you probably haven't heard about, um, and then look to see how much advertising was done on TV, on youth websites, and then this thing that the food companies do called advert gaming, where they create these interactive games that kids can play on the internet that are very um, rich with product placements. And if you take all this best dozen cereals and look to see how much was being advertised, it comes to exactly zero. Then if you take the worst dozen cereals, those are the ones with the least favorable nutrition scores. And now you'll start to see names that you recognize more. And then look to see how much advertising was done in these three uh, media that I mentioned before. And now you see the list pretty, pretty heavily populated. So um, you couldn't, you wouldn't necessarily say the food companies are setting out to make children unhealthy or overweight, but if that were their goal, could they do it much better than this? They all have better cereals in their portfolio, but they're choosing to market the ones that are least healthy to the most aggressively to children. And there's an obvious reason for that that I'll come back to in a minute. So we were hoping um, when we were doing this research to affect, try to affect ultimately social change by working with the press and trying to change public opinion to put pressure on these companies. It's pretty hard to do anything in a regulatory or legislative fashion with, um, with marketing because marketing is considered a form of commercial speech which is protected by the First Amendment of the Constitution, much like political speech or religious speech. 
So it's hard to do that. But if the companies are under a lot of political pressure, uh, public pressure rather, then it's possible they may change. So we were hoping when we were doing this research, depending on what we found, that to get the word out to the, the, the general public pretty widely, which turned out to be the case at the end of the day, um, and to get parents to be pretty upset about what's going on with their children, um, with the marketing and their children. <clears throat> but we tried to figure in advance what the industry's defense of this practice would be. That was part of the strategic questioning that we did. And it wasn't too hard to figure that out uh, because we had debated the you know people in industry on panels and on TV and things like that. And the industry people had written things that um, predicted what we thought their defense would be. And one thing they wrote was a, a paper where the chief nutrition figures for Kellogg and General Mills, companies which are usually competing with each other in a, in a pretty serious way, I got together and collaborated on this paper. And they were talking about whether uh, cereals need sugar in order for children to eat them. And we thought that the, the industry's three-part defense would begin with uh, eating breakfast Eating breakfast is a good thing. That turns out to be true. Second, they would say that cereals can be a good vehicle for delivering nutrients. Well, that turns out to be true as well. But the third part was that children won't eat the cereals unless they have a lot of sugar. And so in this paper, they said food doesn't become nutrition until it's eaten. So the best food in the world that sits in the bowl that a child refuses to eat that provides no nutrition. And further, that children like the taste of ready-to-eat cereals, that's a euphemism for high sugar, and are therefore more likely to eat breakfast. So, so that was, we figured that would be their defense. Well, this, we thought, is a testable hypothesis. Why don't we find out whether this is true? So Jennifer Harris and uh, others at the Rudd Center went to work and designed a randomized trial where children were offered one of two in a random way, one of two breakfasts. Um, they had the same cereal, but different versions of it. So half of the children got a high sugar version of the cereal, like frosted flakes, let's say. The other got a low sugar version of that same cereal that would be like generic corn flakes. Um, and there are a number of possibilities with this, with Rice Krispies and things like that. Um, the, the children could pour as much cereal and eat as much cereal as they wished. Uh, they were given milk and they could add as much milk as they wanted. There was a sugar bowl there so they could add sugar if they wanted. And there was fruit and they could add fruit. And what we found after this randomized experience, this randomized study, was that children that got the high sugar versions of cereal had way more calories than what you'd like to have a child eat for breakfast. And the children who got the low sugar version of the cereal had um, a calorie level much closer to what you'd want a child to have for breakfast. In addition, tended to sweeten the, the cereal not with sugar, but with fruit. So they got a nutrition boost from the fruit. So we then had this data. And when we published and got a lot of press for the, the main marketing study, um, and the press then would call the CEOs of General Mills and Kellogg's and say, Kellogg and say, well, why are you marketing your worst um, cereals to kids? And they would say, well, breakfast is a good thing. Nutrients can be delivered in cereals and kids won't eat them unless they have a lot of sugar. And the press people would say, but there's a study from Yale saying that that's not the case. And the randomized study then became a very important part of the strategic um, discussion. And then a pretty short time after the results were published, General Mills made the announcement that it was reducing the sugar in children's cereals by about 25%. Now, this, was an, this, this is potentially an enormous public health uh, measure. Obviously, you'd like to see a greater reduction than that, but that's a really good start. And um, we could have published study after study after study, and if all they did was remain in the professional literature rather than being exposed to a lot of press attention, uh, our guess is that this probably wouldn't have happened. And I'm also not saying that our research was responsible for this or, or uh, it, at all potentially or in part because there are a lot of people that have been working on this topic for a long time um, when this announcement got made. So who knows what the causal factor was. But to the extent that our 
study, our, our research was um, a, a player, uh, we think that it was because we had gone through these particular uh, mechanisms that we had worked with the press that had, had helped change public opinion and this had changed industry behavior in turn. And that led to the, the, the change that could affect a lot of people all at once. <clears throat> and when, you, when it comes to diet, uh, we believe that you, you can educate people all day long about changing their diet, but it's a pretty hard slog because you're having to compete with vast amounts of very effective advertising from the industry. So something where you just change the food supply by reducing the sugar could potentially be pretty impactful. So that was our second example of strategic research. Um, the, the third area that I'd like to discuss is the high consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages and the policies that have come about as a result of concern raised by years of science on this. Um, when, when we began this work, um, I had the idea of possibly using taxes on sugar-sweetened beverages as a means of addressing this issue. And in 2000, and I wrote, wrote about this in the New York Times going back into the 1990s, 1994 to be exact. Um, but people, and people, we were working on it and people were talking about it a little. Mainly I was getting blistered by the, the people on the political right because of it. Um, but it wasn't something that the field got too jazzed up about because it didn't seem like it was very politically feasible. Now, in 2009 or so, with the economy and the bad state it was, um, governments started thinking about ways to raise revenue to help repair budget deficits that they were having. And so this seemed to be a good time to start thinking about possibly resurrecting the idea or getting uh, emphasizing it more uh, before policymakers on taxing sugar-sweetened beverages. So this piece I wrote with Tom Frieden, who at the time was the health commissioner in New York City, then later, as you may know, became the head of CDC. Um, we, we made a public policy case for taxes on sugared beverages and made a very specific call for taxing any beverage with added sugar at the rate of one penny per ounce. Uh, and we discussed the potential uh, declines that might be expected in sugared beverage consumption, the resulting health benefits, et cetera. Um, we also wanted to then later um, address the issue of the economic case to be made for this, not just the public health case, uh, because um, there are a lot of people who don't, don't believe in getting involved with the, the free market unless certain um, conditions have been met, such as the presence of externalities. So this paper had a broader set of authors, including some uh, really terrific economists and, and others who had worked on this area making both the public health case and the, the economic case for tax and sugar beverages. So now legislators were thinking about soda taxes as a possible um, uh, health intervention and, and a way to help address budget deficits. So we wanted to think at this time about what strategic science would be. Well, how could we do studies that might help this along? And one of the issues that came up a lot was, well, how much can you really expect consumption to go down with taxes at different levels? And then what might be the resulting health consequences? So one of our colleagues at the time, Tanya Andreeva, now at the University of Connecticut, um, did, uh, did some work on elasticities of uh, soda prices and expected changes in consumption. So she uh, developed a model for this and we published this paper um, and it provided, it provided a pretty good sense of how high would a tax need to be in order to get um, meaningful changes in consumption. And it turns out that the penny per ounce tax that we had discussed before was about the, the level that we thought uh, consumers might accept and um, politicians might be willing to embrace. And it would produce a meaningful reduction in sugared beverage consumption somewhere in the area of 10 to 15%. So we, that's, that was that strengthened our uh, concept of the one penny per ounce. Another issue that we came across is, is we're talking to policymakers who might be interested in doing this. Um, there was a lot of interest in these taxes um, in addition to the possible health benefits of reducing consumption um, on raising revenue that could be used for various purposes in government. So it was the revenue part of it that appealed to some legislators 
especially the more conservative legislators, and they thought that this might be a, a justification for doing it. So then the one question that arose was, well, how much revenue can you make uh, if you put in a tax? And so uh, Dr. Andreeva, that I mentioned before, went to work and looked at the revenue generating potential of the these taxes and published this paper on that issue. Um, and she created a nice model that would estimate how much would a a city or a state make if you put in a tax of a penny, a penny and a half, two pennies per ounce of uh, beverages with added sugar and publish this paper. Now, of course, if, if all we had done at that point was publish this paper in the literature, probably no one would have seen it. It probably wouldn't have had much impact because the baton would have been dropped. But what we did at that point was created an interactive website and then publicized the heck out of that website to people in public policy positions so they could go to the website and do something like this. The website still exists, the algorithm has been updated, and so the revenue calculation for the sugar beverage taxes still exists. But what it creates is something like this. So using the state of California, for example, you can put in um, a city or a state the year, the, number, the amount of tax that you'd like to use. In this case, it's, it's a penny and a half um, per ounce of um, added sugar. And then the pass through I can talk about later if we get the time. But um, you can put this in and, and it generates information like this. So for the state of California, and these numbers are current, I just took this off the website a few days ago, uh, the state would raise at, at the end of the day uh, $1.3 billion per year in revenue with a tax of 1.5 cents um, on beverages with added sugar. So between the elasticity work and the revenue work, legislators were in a pretty good position to say how much, how high does should a tax be to raise a certain amount of revenue and to have some health benefit. And then we can um, link our specific proposals to those particular numbers. And so sugar and beverage taxes now exist in a number of places in the US. Uh, the first place in the US to pass them was Berkeley with Oakland and San Francisco coming um, behind pretty quickly. Chicago Cook County had a tax, but then repealed it for political reasons. Philadelphia and Seattle came aboard and a number of other places as well. In the United States, these have been done city by city. Of course, you get a lot more impact if they were done state by state or ultimately if you had a federal tax, um, but those things haven't happened yet. Some states are considering sugar beverage taxes, and we hope those get passed, but none have yet. Uh, none have really uh, gotten far enough in the legislative pr procedures to, uh, to know whether they're viable or not. Um, what I'm anticipating will happen with these, but you know, my crystal ball is no better than anybody else's, is that these taxes will become very common, uh, much like tobacco taxes. Um, when the, the beverage industry, which spends tens of millions of dollars fighting these taxes each time one comes to public attention, uh, when they feel that they're, they're losing the overall battle in a big way, they will go to the federal government asking for a law that preempts states and cities from doing their own. So they'll ask the federal government to pass a tax, but a very low tax, and then forbid states and cities from doing it on their own. So that hasn't occurred yet, but I think it could potentially happen. Outside the U.S., taxes have been passed much more on country levels rather than at local levels. Um, and in, in a number of you know, major countries around the world, um, India, South Africa, France, Chile, Mexico as places, there are about 50 countries around the world now that have these taxes. And there's enough evidence, uh, including some very good work done in the Bay Area, on the San Francisco and Berkeley taxes to see about impact. And they're having quite a positive impact. In some cases, the taxes have been used in a, in a very interesting way to help address um, uh, health equity. And um, the uh, taxes are having the expected changes on consumption that you'd, you'd hope they might. So this is good. So the if going back to our model, we're thinking that the research, the strategic research that got done in this case was having impact through legislation, through public opinion, and through the NGOs that are working on this topic. So that's um, example three of the, um, the strategic research. I'd like to give you one more example. 
um, and then we can wrap it up and, and address questions. It has to do with mis misleading labeling. If you look at these two boxes um, of cereal, you see on the front of the box to the right of the name of the cereal, a green, a box with a green check mark on it that's called Smart Choices. Uh, this is something the food industry introduced in 2009. Um, the, the way this had occurred is the food industry pretty much got together with itself um, with some scientific advisory um, in the process, but basically the industry uh, collaborated with itself to come up with nutrition standards. Uh, if met, then warranted the Smart Choices label to go on food packaging. Um, as you can imagine, the food industry gamed the system so that the standards were lax enough so that just about anything could, could become a smart choice. Uh, witness these, you know, pop cereals and Fruit Loops. And so the, for cereals, the um, standard, they would have a tough standard for fat, but these cereals don't have a lot of fat to begin with, but have a very lax uh, standard for sugar. Beverages would be the same thing. Um, and so the industry created this lax set of standards and produced this, um, 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 emblem that went on these these pa packages that we were worried were misleading the consumers, that consumers would think that, well, this is some government program, there's some reasonable criteria behind it, and it's something I can trust. Um, and that would lead them to, to have per feel permission to have uh, these products when they might not have otherwise have had them. So one of the things that was interesting in this process is after the industry came up with this, uh, right before launching it, they gave a large grant to a professional society, the American Society of Nutrition. Some of you may actually belong to that society. Um, the, it's a well-known, highly regarded society. It, um, they have annual meetings. They publish one of the top journals, the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. Nutrition. But they decided that at that, that time, I think because of who was in their leadership at that time, uh, to take a large amount of money from the food industry to administer this program. And to me, that looked pretty deceptive, like the, the industry was wanting this professional society, wanting, wanting for it to appear that this professional society had come up with this program uh, to hide the fact that it was an industry-based program to begin with, and that the professional society was uh, colluding with them to do this. So uh, we thought, you know, something ought to be done with this. Now, this came on the heels of a previous conversation I'd had with the Attorney General in Connecticut, uh, Richard Blumenthal. He's now the U.S. Senator from Connecticut. Um, Blumenthal, uh, there's the Smart Choices logo. Um, and before I get back to him, here are some examples of things that could be awarded the Smart Choices label. So. <coughs> When I was at Yale, um, I had paid a lot of attention to the work that had been done on tobacco because I thought there were a lot of interesting parallels that might be applied into the area of diet and nutrition and obesity prevention. Um, and the taxes was one such idea, but going after the industry um, in, in a legal way might make sense too. So I wrote a letter to Blumenthal. I hadn't met him before. Uh, he'd been a real hero in the tobacco legislation and was very focused on consumer protection during his time as attorney general. He was really, I thought, a very effective attorney general. Um, and I, I wrote him this letter, and to my surprise, I got a call from his office not long after, and they said, he's, he's very interested in, in talking to you, and he'll come and meet with you. So I was really surprised by that, but he did. We had a nice conversation. And he basically said, we have to wait for the right case to come along to do something, but let's you know, keep the lines of communication open. And then along comes smart choices. And I thought, you know, maybe this is an interesting case. So I got in touch with him and I said, told him all about smart choices and said, maybe we've got an opportunity to do something about misleading and deceptive labeling in this case. So he said, let me look into it a little bit. They got back to me in a few days and the sort of bottom line was this message about let's go get them. And, you know, for an academic just doing research and publishing things in journals, that's pretty darn exciting. 
um, and, and unusual, but it was, you know, interesting. And so we could provide the science that might help with the case, but we wouldn't be the ultimate change agents. It would be the state attorney general who has considerable authority here. And remember what I said before about marketing. It's hard to do things about marketing because of the First Amendment. But if marketing can be proven to be misleading and deceptive, then there are legal authorities, in this case, the attorney generals, attorneys general who are the leading uh, law authority and uh, enforcement people in each state can do something about it potentially. So Blumenthal then uh, launched an official investigation into the Smart Choices program. And a part of his, this process, he held a press conference where it was very effective, where he stood up um, with, I think, a box of Fruit Loops or something in his hand and said, you know, should the citizens of Connecticut be told this is a healthy product? And, you know, it, it was just so clear that it wasn't a healthy product that it, you know, it, it was a very effective way of making the point. Um, at that time, several things happened. Um, so in all in 2009, this series of things played out. So there was a critical article in the New York Times about smart choices that came about because I'd contacted the New York Times, let them, I mean, a writer I knew there, uh, and let them know that smart choices was happening and were they interested in writing about it. Uh, they did. They did their own uh, critique. I mean, they looked into it and did some investigation into it Then wrote a critical article. Uh, that preceded just by a, about a month, um, this, the Connecticut State in Attorney General investigation. Uh, the head of the FDA then held a public phone call, also critical of smart choices. And um, scarcely six weeks after the program had been launched and the, the um, the critique of it had begun, the industry closed the program down and started uh, pulling the uh, boxes that had the, what we thought was misleading labeling on it. Now this, this was a, so we had provided uh, some of the data that helped support the, the uh, attorney general's investigation and had created this communication loop with the change agent that's consistent with that strategic science model that I presented before um, in hopes that something might be done. Now, we could have published 200 studies on smart choices and never produced this impact if the studies just remained hidden in the literature and the baton didn't get passed to anybody. But in this case, the state attorney general was an effective change agent, and we had data that would uh, help him in his investigation. He was also very good at this because he had had conversations with other state attorneys general and the word got out that he wasn't the only one that might take action on this. So this was one of the reasons that um, the program got closed down. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, now, another thing that happened during the, the attorney general's investigation is he issued what were called demand letters, which are just short of a subpoena to the companies that had been involved in the smart choices process demanding information on how decisions were made, who got paid to do this, um, and how the criteria were established. Now, companies are used to getting um, things like this from legal officials, and they probably could have fought this off long enough that smart choices would have outlived its purpose anyway. But he also sent uh, letters to the officers of the professional society demanding information from them. And they're people like you and me, uh, you know, academics for the most part, researchers who were in volunteer positions with these professional societies. And people like us are not used to getting these kind of letters. And there was a lot of bad publicity surrounding this that nobody wanted. And so the industry felt it should just shut it down. So that we felt that this was a pretty important victory because it signaled that somebody is watching that, if, um, if somebody's going to do these kind of things, uh, somebody's watching and somebody in a position to take action might actually get involved. So back to our model, the research then seemed to, to have impact through legal action, state attorney general, and the press. <clears throat> so those are the four examples that, that I can provide. And there, there are others, but those are some examples that talk about these things. Now, some of these studies 
uh, aren't very expensive and can be done pretty quickly. If you think about the first study that I mentioned, the drive-in window thing, you know, the study probably took a couple of weeks. It might have cost $50 for some clipboards, and that would have been about it, but it turned out to have important impacts. Some of the other studies were more involved, but again, not years worth of studies, but maybe months, a few months worth of research could could um, could be done that could be pretty helpful here. And so again, one one question is, should researchers be doing this? Does this sound like advocacy beyond the science? And everybody has to answer that for themselves. You obviously know where I stand on it. But to me, if we do research and then drop the ball at that point, hoping that somebody else will pick it up and do something with it, then I think we're engaging in wishful thinking. I, because very often the impact doesn't really occur where it might. Now, what will it take for the field to be doing more of this? By the way, there are lots of examples of researchers who do do this. I think, for example, of um, Al Somer, who some of you may know was a former dean of the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. You know, a person responsible for saving millions of lives through his work on vitamin A supplementation and, and work that was occurring in the poor countries on this. And he did a lot of the original basic science showing that vitamin A deficiencies were leading to lots of difficult medical problems, including blindness, um, and that supplementing, uh, providing vitamin A supplementation could reduce an awful lot of this. He did all that research, but he didn't stop there. He started working with national governments to see about getting supplementation done on a broad level. He worked out how much it would cost, the, the sort of things that we've done with the soda taxes, um, and then ultimately had huge impacts. So we're talking about lives saved in the millions um, by a researcher not, ju not just doing the research and then stopping the process there. So I think there are some examples of this. Now, of course, we want to be unbiased as much as we can on our research. It needs to be subjected to peer review. But if we go back to the model I presented before, if we think about <clears throat> if, if our research is really going to matter, are we going to be, are, is there a way we can take our research and it can be harnessed to produce less depression, less stress, whatever issue we happen to be working on, who are the people or institutions that can actually make that happen? It's almost never the scientist. Uh, but is it the press? Is it, are they elected leaders? Is it the regulatory authorities? Who is it? Is, are they philanthropies that might spend money dealing with this problem? Um, private donors? I mean, there are a lot of potential change agents here, but whoever they are, can we ask what information is important in their world and what questions uh, if addressed, would help them make decisions about this and provide them ammunition for making the changes they want. Can we turn that into specific research? And then can we communicate that back to the change agents in a reasonable way? And again, it doesn't supplant uh, programmatic research, but I think might be a companion to it. Now, ac the academic world really isn't set up very well for this because we're not trained to do this. Uh, we're not reinforced for it uh, when people are hired or promoted very seldom, even in a school of public policy, uh, where you'd think this would be more relevant. Do these kind of, do, do, does this kind of behavior uh, get, I mean, do we have metrics for it? Do we understand, can we define it? Do we understand when it happens? And then even more important, can we train people to do it? Can, in incoming generations of graduate students, can they be doing this kind of thing? Um, and should they be doing? And those are all questions we can ask. Now, I, when, I, when we started developing this model, I had one, one uh, set of misgivings I had was, what about our graduate students? If they're doing this kind of work, um, then how will their careers go if they're entering a profession that doesn't value this or hasn't really thought about it very much? And so I, I was really very worried about that. Um, but our graduate students were courageous and, and willing to take on these, uh, these topics and do research on them. And the, some of the people I mentioned, Christina Roberto, Marie Bragg, Ashley Gearhart, uh, Marlene Schwartz, Rebecca Poole, others who work with me at Yale, 
um, were courageous enough to do this kind of work and ended up with career, terrific careers um, because they did, they did good quality work. The work always got subjected to peer review. They did the traditional academic things, but there was a strategic science overlay on it that they found gr very gratifying, I think, and certainly I did. So it was fun, fun to do this research and different. And so I'm hoping the field can think more about this and we can start to ask ourselves, what kind of impact do we really want to have? Certainly we want to impress other scientists and get lots of citations and things like that. But beyond that, what kind of impact do we hope to have? And if we're going to have that impact, what do we need to do? And can we do that in a, any systematic way? And I hope that the, um, these comments are um, you know, provocative in that sense and can help us get thinking about that. So thank you all for having me and Alyssa for inviting me to do this particular talk. And um, if there's an opportunity for questions, I'll be happy to take them. Kelly, thank you so much. That was everything we hoped for and more. Such important messages for our field. It fits into our conference so well. We've talked a lot about the big social and policy changes we need for our new world. We really can't just do the same type of research we've been doing and remain siloed. Um, I'd like to open it up to questions from our audience. We have a question from Candace Price of UC Davis. Hi, it was a pleasure to hear you speak. Um, I have a question regarding the sugar sweet beverage tax. So we're basically trying to do what we did with the tobacco industry. And I'm wondering um, what is missing today in those efforts to get this tax passed um, and in comparison to what was done with the tobacco industry? Yeah, it, it's a very good question. And um, so a, a number of colleagues around the country who uh, have worked on these taxes and are, I'm working with to write a paper on sugar sweetened beverages 2.0, taxes 2.0, to see what the next generation of this will look like. And it's to address that very question you raised, how can we have more of these taxes and therefore be affecting more people. And it raises a lot of interesting strategy questions. Should the next generation be to have uh, taxes at state or federal levels, or should we work at local levels and just have more victories? <clears throat> should you, and when taxes are established, as they now have been, say, in San Francisco, Oakland, and Philadelphia, and Seattle, what should they do? Should they increase the, the amount of the taxes as time goes forward, which is what happened with tobacco? Should more things be taxed? Should it be more than just sugar sweetened beverages or should it be all foods with added sugar? Should it be fast food? Should fat be a consideration, et cetera? Those are all really interesting strategic issues. Um, and then what kind of research gets done to help address that becomes very important. So I'm very optimistic about the future of sweetened beverage taxes, but I think if there is some concerted national coordinated effort to say what's the next step and how can we all work together to accomplish it, we'll probably be better off. So thanks for the question. One last question from Julian Thayer of UC Irvine. Hi, Kelly. Good to see you. Thanks. Uh, for the great talk. So I have sort of a, maybe let's call it a meta question. Uh, and I want to see how you handle this. So when I'm approached by the press, I'm very skeptical uh, because in, the in my experience, they've often gotten it, the research wrong when they report it. And how do you handle that? I've basically stopped talking to the press. Oh, so yeah. Yeah, that is, you know, I hear that from, from colleagues a lot. Um, my, my first thing is try to take the perspective of the press. So if you think about most of these writers, they have, um, you know, they're writing about something different almost every day. I mean, one day it's a volcano and the next day it's hurricanes and then it's a communicable disease and then it's soda taxes. You know, it's all these kind of things. So it's really hard to figure out who are the real experts to talk to, who has a a bone to pick, you know, who has a conflict of interest and how do I get all this done and before I have to move on to the next story. And it really becomes hard to do that. Um, so 
I tend to say that once in a while they're going to get it wrong, which for me has been the case. They have uh, they have uh, gotten it wrong, but not a ton. For me, I'm, and I'm, I'm grateful I've had a more positive experience than you have, and maybe it's the nature of our work and mine's just easier to communicate. But I think uh, in my case, I think they've, they've, they get it right most of the time or pretty right most of the time. And I'm willing to take my lumps on the other side in order to get the word out as much as possible. So I tend to trust them when they do get it wrong. You know, that happens. I get it wrong sometimes too. And, and that's just the way life goes. So I, I tend to be accepting of that and, uh, and know that it's going to happen. But overall, I tend to trust the press. I think it's an important voice for us and we need to take the risks. That's, and I learned that from you, Kelly. Our last question um, from our Zoom audience, Elisa will read it. Hi, um, this is from Bill Klein. At NIH. At NIH, um, terrific presentation. Wondering if you could comment on the training end of things. We do have emerging programs in implementation science, as well as NIH workshops in this area, but most graduate programs in behavioral science do not focus on the kinds of skills needed for this policy impact. Thoughts on how to address? Thank you. Well, thanks, it's a really, really important question. Um, you know, I think it probably begins with changing our metrics for what behavior we um, value in, in our students and in ourselves when we're doing things like hiring and promotion. And my guess is that if this kind of work gets accepted as, as part of acceptable work for people in academic settings, then we will come up with better training programs in order to produce that. Uh, but one thing we could do would be to say, okay, let's really examine the concept of impact. Let's think about how we can best define that given what we're hoping to accomplish. And now how can we train students in order to, to think about that as one thing they may choose to do with their science. Uh, we could bring in policymakers or potential change agents to talk about how, how they make decisions and what's important in their world. And uh, to give some examples of kind of strategic questions that would be important to them. Uh, to have some of the students and faculty members who do do this kind of work uh, come and give talks as examples of how this might work. And I think then we have a chance of developing some systematic and effective training um, training programs. So yeah, that I really appreciate that question. Wonderful. Kelly, we are so grateful to you for your work over so many decades. You are such an inspiration to to all of us. And you have shown us a map and a path of how we can make the changes that we dream about, that we hope our work will result in. So, so much gratitude to you and thank you for joining us. And so let's have an applause. And, and this also marks the end of our conference with our virtual attendees. So we're gonna end the Zoom and uh, Elisa Hamlet, who's been managing the chat, has been telling us about all the, the praise and enthusiasm and great questions. And Kelly, if you wanna stay on a minute to answer the questions, that's fine. We're just gonna stop the recording part. Um, so Elisa, did you wanna say bye? Bye. Bye. Bye everybody.